they say give me a Coke, they mean give me a Coca-Cola. They literally mean give me a Coke. In fact, <laughs> people get visibly upset. You, I'm not saying it was me looking in a mirror, but it might have been. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss the mechanics of storytelling and relate them to tabletop roleplay games. Plus, the guys use genre cards to generate a scenario and characters for a last-minute RPG session. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to podcast number 25. As always, I am Chris, and I'm joined by Jim. Hi. And I'm also joined by Doc. Hello, hello. And uh, today we've got a, uh, a few items of discussion for you. We've got, um, what was our main discussion? <laughs> Mark uh, drawing a blank. Uh, mechanics of story in yes. role-playing games. Yes, mechanics of story and particularly focused on um, tabletop role-playing. Um, but first, we had a little bit of a, uh, a warm-up that we were going to do. Um, Jim threw this idea out there earlier today, and we realized that it could actually be um, applied very practically because later this evening after we finish recording we're going to be doing a test run of a RPG system we're designing. Uh, so Jim, do you want to tell us about your idea? Sure. Well, what I was thinking that we could do that might be a little fun um, is use the genre cards that uh, you know Doc and Chris designed. Um, if you want to do a quick plug we can edit that in. <laughs> right here. The, uh, the quick Kickstarter plug? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I'm saying we can edit it in later oh. unless, you wanted to, unless you want to do it now. Nah. <laughs> okay. uh, but yeah, that'd be the perfect spot to like just do like an inner splice, like cut it in like real quick, like about you know fifteen thirty second plug. And Genres, then, like, the card game of crazy cross yeah, yeah, yeah. genre adventure, that sort of thing. And then just and with Kickstarter available, on the, you know what I'm saying? And then, available and then, now on Kickstarter. Yeah, and then we'll, I'll, I'll just kind of go back and talk. Almost no one, no one like references it or pretends like that happened. <laughs> Uh, and, we, and we say something like, no, I, I don't really want to do that. I think it would be pandering. <laughs> we're but, we're leaving way, all of this in, by the yes, way. We're not we cutting are. any of this. I, no, okay. I know. I know. All right. <laughs> what I, I'm going to say every time, and then I go back and I realize that some of it has been cut. Occasionally. Okay. Where'd that metafiction card go? Part, part, parts of it gets cut, but parts of it stays in. So. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the idea is that we're going to use the genre cards to... Uh, sort of build a narrative mm-hmm. and uh, well, a narrative for an RPG campaign mm-hmm. uh, to build some characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, the basic, not necessarily even the role playing characters, but some of the characters in the world, like mm-hmm. the antagonist, um, the, the protagonist or protagonists, um, possibly you know different important characters that might show up, um, NPCs. The main thing is going to be setting. And basic plot structure, basic story, that kind of thing. Yep. Um, the idea being that it's a generic system we're going to be testing, so rather than at the time we start the test trying to figure out when the world we're going to play the game about, we're going to be generating it using our genre cards. Yeah. So it should be fun, and we don't know what we're going to get, so that's part of the fun. Exactly. And if we don't get something good, I'll say, we'll talk about how we're going to cut it and mm-hmm. change it, and then I'll say, don't cut it, and Chris <laughs> will cut it. So Yes. <laughs> we're letting you into the creative process behind the Backward Compatible <laughs> Podcast. Oh my... Scary. <laughs> All right. So Doc has the card. So I do. I do indeed. Well, as per the uh, the rules, what I'm going to do is actually deal out uh, four cards, and that's going to become the pool. So there's those. The pool is Alien, Rocket Man, Automotive, Nautical. And remember, you build your character by spending starting XP in order to create the kind of character that you want to create. And so, uh, with the way that we're starting this, um, you should probably have four XP to mm-hmm. begin with, and of course you're going to have to give me one of those cards to generate the, the scene with, and also give me a card to generate um, from the middle, from the pool. So. All right. Okay. Um, so, I think I'll take Alien. Alien's always fun. We're doing this right now purely for story reasons, so it doesn't really matter the mechanics of the cards. Exactly. Alternate history has come out. So are you gonna are you gonna tell us anything about for the listeners anything about the alien card? Uh, no. Any reason why you picked it? Just um, for fun. Just because or? alien is fun in role playing games. Okay. So. Because alien. Fair enough. Now is that a specific alien? No, just alien is a genre of fiction. Alien fiction. Okay. But it is from another planet, not from another country. Probably another planet. Yeah. Although not necessarily. Well, not necessarily. It could it could actually just be you know like uh, 
uh, an illegal uh, immigrant okay. from another planet. Well, could it be the brother from another planet? A classic science fiction movie oh. you also haven't seen, right? <laughs> Probably not. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll add that one to The Wizard, all of Star Trek, and uh, whatever else it was we were talking about. Not earlier. all of Star Trek. Oh, sorry. <laughs> J.J. Abrams doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they, they punched out like a little hole in my nerd card and gave it back to me. Uh-huh. So I, I still have a, a little speck of my nerd card left. Oh, okay. So. Oh, they actually gave you the hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the Chad. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Nice. Exactly. It wasn't still kind of hanging off the edge. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a very old joke. Too, too old. Mm. But yeah. But. So do you want any of these, Jim? Okay, so I get to pick from yours? Uh, from this pool, yeah. Oh, okay. It's so a we, shared pool. Oh, it's a shared pool. Okay, cool. So I'm going to look over here. Oh, i got to pick Rocket Man right off the bat. All right. Because I'm a rocket man. That's rocket replaced man with... is replaced with punk. Okay. Um, I would go with punk, but then all of a sudden it just becomes Invader Zim, and I don't want to do that. So, um, I kind of like alternate history. We'll go with alternate history. Okay, excellent. That is replaced by robot. Hmm. Nice. Now, I didn't. I didn't look at my actual level, so we have to. Pick them based on the numbers. Oh no, no, not at all. Because um, you said we have four XP. Correct? Right. Mm. So it's we're... one XP per card. Oh, one XP yeah. per card. It's so not... in other words, you're taking you're taking four cards. Mm. Oh, okay. So but the level... one of those four cards you're gonna have to give to me. Okay. So the level doesn't actually affect. Not not in the way that we're doing okay. it. Um, just as a generator. Okay. So um, I'm a rocket man, and I'm gonna go for punk. Da, 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 da. Yeah. I'm a big uh, fan of uh, The Rocketeer as well. Gotcha. Another movie that you haven't seen? Probably. School Days. <laughs> I like School Days. I'm digging School Days. Excellent. For what it's worth, Jim, we're actually doing all of these from the Pop deck, which okay. is the one that's available. It's the first set. That oh, that's the, the Kickstarter? Yeah, that's, that's our level. that's our okay. base level one. That Pirate is going out. And this Pop, is it called Pop? Is it Pop Culture? Pop Culture, yeah. yeah. Okay. Genre, colon, pop. Okay. Mm-hmm. I suppose like Jiffy Pop. Yeah. Right. Okay. Or popping a balloon or something like that. Or, hey, Pop, how's it going? Yeah. I haven't or talked to you in a while. Crack open a pop if you're from the north. There you so, go. Yeah. Or, or a Coke mm-hmm. if you're... Everything's a Coke. You know, just two from Texas. Supposedly. That's what they I, say. I, I I've actually, never heard that. I, I challenge that assumption. I do, too. Because here we like Dr. Pepper, and so we would actually specify Coke versus Dr. Pepper. But That's correct. Everyone would. I mean, I, 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 lived, I lived in Louisiana for a while, too, and I've lived through in various places in Texas, and no one's ever done the whole say coke but they really mean something else yeah, yeah ever I've, I've never heard that i think it's just that coke is really popular so people order coke a lot yeah it's like give me that's a all coke. it is yeah but when they say give me a coke they mean give me a coca-cola they literally mean give me a coke. <laughs> people get visibly upset if you i'm not saying it was me looking in a mirror but it might have been <laughs> when they bring me a pepsi and i say what is this i ordered a coke i don't want a pepsi. <laughs> Well, okay. sometimes though, it's a restaurant, like because they always sort of like pick the the brand that they use yes, exclusively. They so do. when you say Coke, they bring you a Pepsi because they don't have Coke. Mm-hmm. So we're not getting any money from Coca Cola. No, no, this no. this information infomercial for Coca Cola. <laughs> Although Coca Cola is the brand that they use at ETD. So there you go. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Product placement. Uh, okay. So hey, we'll just cut all that out because otherwise it would be pandering. <laughs> <laughs> don't put it. No, I don't think it was pandering. It was just talking about uh, uh, cultural differences in the way we call sodas. So. Okay, I, I like I like soda personally. I just call soda? it soda. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pop's a little strange to me. Yeah, how does automotive relate to? Just automotive as a genre. So um, you could be a driver of some sort or someone who is interested in automotive things. But I'm a rocket man driver. You have a rocket car. I guess that's true. I want to somehow be some like some sort of transformer thing. Uh, you could do that. Steam has come out. If you took a robot, you'd be set up for the Transformer thing quite easily. So what are the four that are in the middle right now? Um, robot, Pirate, Steam, and Nautical. Oh, okay. Steam Pirate, that sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. If you had pirate ships, they're basically those uh, big old steamboat ferry things. Yeah. That'd be kind of neat. Yeah, Nautical Steam Pirate. Yeah. Maybe. Mm. Maybe. Although Aviation Steam Pirate would also be very awesome. Mm. Now, the order in which you and I go, Jim, doesn't really matter. So are there there's any of these four that you want? Um, I guess I, I guess robot. Robot? It kind of fits with what I'm doing. Cool. Yeah, but keep in mind, one of your four, you're going to have to give to me. That's true. Okay. No, it's not necessarily a bad thing because we're trying to make an interesting setting. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So, Correct. Yeah. Okay, and that's been replaced by... Pulp. Pulp Fiction. And not the movie. Mm-hmm. Necessarily. And not the, uh, those little, like, floaty things that are in orange juice. Right. Right. I strained that out. Like your little eye pulps? Yes. Yes. Well, you know, of course, Pulp Fiction was named for the poor quality of paper upon which it was printed originally. 
And again, we're not talking about the movie. We're talking about yeah. That. I was about to, I was, the first second there. I was like, the movie? No, no, the I movie knew, was I knew named that for the for the book yeah. 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 named yeah. after yeah. the yeah. paper. So, all right, your your pick. Right. Um, I'm going to go with the pirate. Why not pirate? Why not pirate? Why not pirate? And I don't guess it matters, but that's actually replaced by Mecca. Mecca. Okay. Well, we are going to have to give you one or two from here. So that's true. It does matter. That it does matter. You're right. Yes. How silly of me. Okay, so that's it. All right. I've got four in the middle to pick from. you got to give me one from that. And then each of you has one, so you've got to give me one from that. And that will generate the, the scene. All right. Um, I'm going to give you Alien because I have a very specific idea of oh. my three genres. Okay. How about you, Jim? I'm going to give you Punk because I like the description. For the scene. Excellent. It's like rebellious counterculture type stuff, so I think that's interesting. One from the middle. All right. Pulp, Mecca, Steam, or Nautical. I kind of like the idea of giving him Mecca. Yeah. All right. It'll be an interesting mixture. Yes. All right, excellent. Uh, Now, normally in the game, I would randomize these, and they Mm -hmm. would come out randomly, Um, but what I'm actually going to do, because we are generating something um, intentionally here mm-hmm. is look at them and decide which of the three combinations I like. So I have unsuspecting, rebellious, and futuristic, capital city, counterculture, and space cruiser, and um, where you have to learn why aliens are invading and drive them away, where you have to convince someone they can't trust the system, and where you have to learn to pilot a prototypical mecha and launch it to turn the tides of a desperate battle. So I like the idea of you guys being on a space cruiser, so I'm going to do that. Um, but it is going to be a rebellious space cruiser mm-hmm. um, where you have to learn why aliens are invading and drive them away. It so actually works quite nicely for my it, it does. It, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait, so is, so, this, is this Macross? It's, <laughs> is this Super Dimensional Fortress Macross? No, it it, it's more like, it's more like a, a ship from the Rebellion. Um, there, there was this very popular movie called mm-hmm. uh, Trek Wars or something. We're right. allowed to say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say what? Star Wars. Oh, yeah, that's what it was called. Yes. Yeah, the trailer might have come out today. I don't yeah, know. it might have. Yeah, it just might have. Yeah, I was thinking of giant ship as opposed to <laughs> lots of ships, I guess. Oh, well, no. This is literally a ship of the Rebellion, because okay. it's a rebellious ship, um, and aliens have uh, have boarded it, and now you're going to have to figure out why. So, there we go. That's that's the first that's the first scene. All right. And that's where it's going to go from there. Cool. Well, um, so tell me about your characters. Be sure to give me a name. So I've got alternate pirate school days or alternate history pirate school days. Nice. And so what I'm imagining is an alternate history in which the pirates are the government and the governments are the pirates. Um, and so I'm actually a, uh, <laughs> a cadet at the uh, basically the pirate navy, if you will. So it's military school um, where they train you how to be pirate, essentially. Mm. Um, and it just so happens that either this is the ship that we're on um, as part of that school, or it's kind of like a field trip or a training exercise or something like that. So my um, my pirate space cadet is on that ship. Excellent. Um, and I do not know a name yet. So, um, what would I call him? Well, while you're thinking of that, I guess I'll mm-hmm. describe my concept. Unless you already know. No, go for it. I'll, okay. I'll think of a name. All right, so I've got automotive automotive robot rocket man, or oh, rocket excellent. man. But I'm going to rocket man. So essentially, I'm going for this kind of. Uh, my concept is basically that I'm a I'm a rocket man, but I'm sort of like a, a robot cyborg type thing where you know I'm i built to be like a human. Mm-hmm. And uh, the automotive aspect, I'm transforming into um, some sort of. I'm sort of viewing it as like transforming into like a large bike. I like the idea of like a bike that rides around in space, like Hog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you've ever seen uh, like Lobo from from comics, he rides on base, basically like a space motorcycle. Nice. That kind of thing. Only I'm all, I am the space motorcycle, so I'm transforming into the space. Very kind cool. of with like, I still have part of my body. Like a You're sp- like a wear bike? Yes. Yeah. Sort okay. of. Or like a, like a, like a centaur, like a bike tar. Bike tar. Bike tar. <laughs> what, wasn't there something like that in um, Titan AE? Pro- you remember, probably. You remember that cartoon? Yeah, yeah no, I, I do remember that. Yeah, actually. I'm trying to think if there was something like it. Because I, I definitely remember like something it. that wasn't Transformers, where basically it could transform into a vehicle of some sort. Yeah, uh, but there was, like, there was also bikers. Mm-hmm. There, was, there was alien bikers, mm-hmm. I'm sure to remember. And I like that idea. I like it a lot. Yeah. So um, I'm going to say that the aliens that have invaded the ship are actually biker aliens. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's great. That, that they're, you know, like a... 
uh, by gang of the aliens here for happy hour. No, they're after. Did, um, did I hustle them in a bar, at a space bar? <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Maybe you did, but uh, you'll have to figure that one out because okay. they're they're definitely after you, um, specifically. Okay. So the the ship then is called the keyboard, and we're in the space bar, right? Ah, oh. right. I'm filling in for Will today, guys. <laughs> So anyway, I also don't know name yet. So if you if you right. want to try to figure um, out, um, you're going so with the classic RPG character Naname. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking uh, something beard for the pirate thing. It's uh, you know what? We'll go with we'll go with Blackbeard. I'm like the great 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 grandson of King Blackbeard. Okay, back in the day, we're not royalty anymore, right? Because pirates, right? And what is your designation, um, Robo Biker? Hmm. I was going to go for something like, you know, simple, more like a title, like Rocket Rider or something like that. Oh, nice. That sounds a little, seems like I need some sort of little name for it or something along, or maybe like, um, how about I'll be, I'll be Rocket Rider 009, so it's sort of like a Cyborg 009 reference and throw that in there as well. You could also just, I'm also tossing in a Mock Rider because I I was sort of a little bit inspired Mm -hmm. by Mock Rider. I've been emulating that game recently. NES game is pretty cool. You could, um, maybe just call yourself Harley. Harley. No, because that I associate that too strongly with Harley Quinn now. Oh, okay. So I associate it as a female name. Okay. But interesting. Yeah. Well, you feel with Suzuki or Davis. Oh, I kind of like that. Or actually. Davidson. I actually like Suzuki. That's Suzuki. <laughs> but I, I'm thinking of myself more as a, um, um, like not. I, I don't even know. Actually, I guess I guess I'm thinking of myself sort of as non. I don't want to even say non-ethnic. Like, I don't. I'm, I'm a robot, so I don't really have any sort of ties. So I want to have something that sounds like rope, like it's not tied to any sort of culture, like like Earth culture. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm going with like a like a title and then a number designation. So just you're, like you're a UBO and unidentified Viking object. Or I could just be instead of the rocket part, I could just be like <laughs> like Rider zero zero nine or like Rocket zero zero nine. You know, one of the two. You could just be a part number. Just zero zero nine. Yeah, like just a unit number. You in zero zero nine. Unit number zero. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. Or, or what is it? What is the designation for? We for, call you Uno for bikes yeah. or something like that. Yeah, I guess I guess unit number zero zero nine could work. I mean, I am I do have like a personality though. Like it is. Well, I kind of I kind of like actually unit number writer. zero, and we just call you Uno. Okay. You're, sure. the, you're the first of your kind that we found, and because it's a computer, it's a tech society. We start at zero. We don't start at one. So you were just the first one, and therefore you are unit number zero. I was going to say I was the last one. That's going to be my story. There were others, but I'm the last one. Last of your kind. Yeah. Okay. And that's why you're zero, because there will be no more. They were counting down. Yeah. Cool. I, like I mean, I guess it's... I should just go with zero. I mean, that's so much cooler. I like Uno. It's got... Well, it's got... Well, zero works too. Uno sound, it automatically makes me sound like I'm wearing a sombrero. I'm Z- sorry. Z- I, can't, <laughs> I can't get over that picture in my head of me just like wearing like a space sombrero. <laughs> and as cool as that sounds, I, did, I don't really have the cards to support that. It just feels like it's coming out of nowhere. It's like too many too many things to throw. So I could dig in here for Western. It's interesting. So we're just, we're just going for zero then? Yeah. All right. Like zero. Cool. All right. Zero. So we have Blackbeard and Zero. Okay. Blackbeard and Zero, the space pirates who are going to have to uh, nope. learn why aliens are invading and drive them away from this rebellious space cruiser. And I'll say my last name is Nine to throw in the Nine part in there. Okay. Maybe that's like the number of parts that were put together. Zero Nine? Yeah. All right. Okay, it's good. So we've got our um, setting, mm-hmm. and we've got our characters. So, do we want to also try to use cards to do something like, you know, to come up with an antagonist or do some sort of additional character or motivation or something, or do we want to go from here? Because I think we we probably have more time to mm-hmm. build this if we want to add additional level to it. Because mm-hmm. um, that could be kind of like the opening scene, but we could also come up with who the antagonist is ultimately going to be. Yeah, so is what I was because I was thinking we, that might be interesting to try to see if we can right. get that. Well, then let me refresh the card here with a ninja. Now, do, you, do you need to write any of that down, by the way? Are you going to remember all of oh, that? Oh, I'll totally remember okay. it. <laughs> hey, if you remember your cards, I'll, I'll be fine. Okay. But uh, I need, I'll need i need three cards for the antagonist. Then. All right, so shall we give him ninja? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, if we're in like a sort of... I think that would be a fun addition. Okay. Mm-hmm. We've got a pirate here, so I yeah. mean, obviously we're at odds already. Now you get to choose from adventure as well. Adventure. Um... 
It just became ninjas versus pirates in space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to give nautical because when you're already in space, but the nautical could be also be reinterpreted as the way yeah, that sure. space is interpreted inside this. Sort of, except I'm sort of doing the opposite I mean, it, it's basically yeah. how, like, any space navy uses, obviously, naval Correct. terms. So, yeah. ships and... Um, I think it fits. Yeah. And, and maybe, finally, so maybe he's, like, an officer or something, fantasy. potentially. Um, mm -hmm. Pulp steam fantasy. I'm leaning right. towards pulp. I don't like pulp. You don't like pulp? No. Nautical steam ninja, come on. Yeah, steam is, steam is a pretty good choice, too. The only thing is with the whole space stuff, it... Well, it could be like sort of the steampunk culture continued, maybe even from another planet. Yeah. So maybe it's a very steamy planet, and they just use steam because that's their most abundant resource. So, I suppose that works. You know, Empire's End uses that device. It's a Dark Horse comic that actually talks about the actual death of the Emperor, which was not when we thought it was, because he had clone tanks. Oh, yeah. 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 I remember the Dark Horse comic one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and then this way I can also, you know, have some sort of exhaust on my... Uh, my large bike transformation, so it feels there you like go. an actual muscle. Yeah, so um, nautical, nautical Steam Ninja just seems the way to go here. So um, he is from a deep blue workshop uh, where you have to sneak into your target's home, assassinate him, and escape. So that's what he's trying to do to you. Okay. Is to sneak into your home, which of course is this, uh, <clears throat> which of course is this rebellious space cruiser. And... Um, He's going to try to assassinate you and escape. Mm. So there you go. See, it works that it's a rebellious space cruiser because if the pirates reign, rebellion is the norm. That's so, right. Yeah, it's just one of our ships, essentially. So, there you are. Looks like we're good to go. All right. Cool. We have cool. our scenario, and we will uh, report back to you on the... Uh, the, uh, the happenings of this particular thing when we run it. We're going to be recording it um, mainly for archival purposes, but who knows, we might eventually put it out. So um, stay tuned for the, uh, the adventure that comes from this mess we have created. <laughs> but there you go. Cool. Once upon a time, a long time ago, uh, I taught a class called Mechanics of Story. It was a class out of, of my own design and making based on the idea that so often we understand good story or we recognize good story when we see it, but we may not necessarily uh, understand why it's good. And so some of the things that I wanted to explore in that were, are there set patterns in story that we can identify and recognize when we see them? And maybe should we even be writing story to it? Mm. And that was the real question behind it is, Whenever you look at someone like Joseph Campbell, who says that there's like 17 or 18 different phases, um, depending on which version of his book you're looking at, mm -hmm. you know, now that we know that, should we write a story to it? And George of course, Lucas says yes. <laughs> and there are examples, that, very popular examples, that um, follow it. Mm -hmm. And the question becomes, are they good because they followed it, or because you know are they good of their own accord and it just so happens they follow it or what um you know highest grossing movie ever was avatar right so if we look at it it's just the hero's journey mm -hmm. very very specifically down the line um harry potter and star wars are the same story because it's about this orphan who finds he has magical powers and goes and you know has to go into a new world and try to get the boon and bring it back and save everybody mm -hmm. and, and what's interesting about the monomyth is and it was probably designed this way or come to it came to be this way you know pretty naturally that um it's broad enough that especially if you don't say you need to have every single step in the monomyth um that you can still have the elements of the monomyth pretty much in every story ever um because it is fairly Generic, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, if you sort of explain it correctly, and there be there be people who could also try to explain how you know they're, these same examples maybe don't match the monomyth or whatever. Um, but you could sort of break down any given story and say that this is this and this is this, and sometimes you might have to stretch a bit, but you know you can always sort of find that monomyth structure and just about any story. Or put a, move a couple of things around in terms of order. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. it doesn't happen mm -hmm. exactly in the same order. Well, there's a researcher out now, right now who's um, doing it, and he says that uh, there's two phases. 
basically. It's mm-hmm. his name. His name's Cal Bashir, mm-hmm. and he says, as long as you've got um, the other world, mm-hmm. and you just circle around out of that other world, you've got it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's as simple as as he's made it. So. It's kind of like the old uh, thing. It's like basically there are two stories. You know, either a stranger comes to town or someone leaves. Right. And the stranger represents that other world, or it's someone leaves the town to go into the other world. Exactly. So, but, yeah. well, all you're doing is shifting perspective on that one. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. the the stranger can be the hero mm-hmm. um, or not. Yeah. Because yeah. as soon as the hero goes somewhere else, he's the stranger. Mm-hmm. So then, of course, there's the question, and this is perhaps a, another topic entirely, of, you know, should we sort of write to a, a monomyth or, um, you know, kind of try to be mechanical with your story? And I think that really comes down to who you are as an author. Mm-hmm. Um, I think some people work better when they have a structure they're trying to follow. Um, I think other people tend to work better when they can kind of just sort of let ideas come free flow. Um, but that being said, you know, there are kind of the fundamental elements of story that, um, you know, it's often said in art that, you know, the rules exist to be broken. And so it's like, you know, a true artist never is bound by the rules. Well, in fact, they really are bound by the rules and they know the rules better than anyone else. Um, what they do is they know when to break the rules and how. Um, and that's kind of where the difference lies. Someone who knows when the right time to break the rules is not just breaking them, you know, left and right because mm-hmm. they can, you know, because the rules exist because there are certain, um, preconceived there's a there's a cultural understanding there's you know just kind of people's experience they know essentially how things work just based on you know their life experience um kind of lost my train of thought there but the the point being that like people will come into something actually you don't have to explain there are a lot of things in the story when you're writing that you don't have to explain to the audience because they understand a lot from everything else they've seen, mm-hmm. um, other movies, other books, other you know, you name it. So you're talking about playing with expectation, mm-hmm. also. Yeah, playing with expectation, but then knowing at what point you can move away from expectation without right. alienating people, without confusing people, and kind of making it, um, you know, use that to your advantage. Well, I think that's that's why you don't alienate them is because mm-hmm. they're expect if they're expecting you know a certain thing to happen because that's that's what's expected in this type of story and mm-hmm. then it doesn't and something else happens then it becomes kind of like a cl- possibly a clever twist mm-hmm. unfortunately and I'll, uh, to bring this around to talk a little bit about video games a lot of times the clever twist in video games is basically the same one every time yeah. so it's gotten to the point where for example the whole um, uh, you know the, the old story with like the knight rescuing like the damsel in distress mm-hmm. has been uh, when it was first Early, earliest flipped on its head, it becomes, oh, it's kind of new and mm. interesting. But it's become that way so often, and it, video games in particular have done mm. that so many times that it's now become, it's become so, like, cliche mm. that now it would almost be... The, the twist it would, it would that, basically be fresh yeah. at this point if they reverse it again, practically, because we're to the point now where it's, like, it's common to see, like, you know, the badass female heroine mm. now. So it's become kind of the reverse, almost. And I think that's maybe just part of the storytelling process and, like, trends of the culture and the time and all that. Mm-hmm. So I do I do think that in terms of, like, following a script or following a structure or following whatever is the, the current trend, I think that that's something that the very best writers are always aware of mm-hmm. and they're capable of um, doing something different and doing something different because um, they recognize what's been done mm-hmm. and also because they have a story to tell that, you know, fit, they're not just doing it for a gimmick, in other words. They have a story that they could, they're going to tell that is... Um, in some way running counter to mm-hmm. the current trends mm-hmm. um, or structure. And where the uh, the mechanics of story play in um, to kind of what our main discussion was going to be in general is um, role-playing games, tabletop role-playing mm-hmm. games. And the idea that essentially what a tabletop role-playing game is, at least as far as I describe it, is it's a collaborative storytelling um, game. Essentially, you're, you're teaming up with your friends. You know, you got the game master often, but not always, and you've got your other players, and everyone is working together to tell a somewhat emergent story with the structure of the game's rules sort of serving as the scaffolding that you build upon. Um, and one of the interesting questions um, when you're designing a role playing game or when you're searching for the type of game you want to play is um, what are the rules really meant to do? You know? Um, are the rules there basically to, 
you know, the, the, the sort of the common thing is, you know, you got your combat, you've got your non-combat mm. stuff that happens in a role-playing game. Um, and a lot of game systems are designed around the idea that combat's kind of like the core of the gameplay. And so all the rules are about, like, here are your stats and here are the um, the things that your character can do and how well they can do it and if you hit, how much damage do you do. And then there are other, like, you know, secondary skills and stuff like that that aren't necessarily combat related. But effectively what you have is the simulation portion of the the game being dealt with in the rules. And then the story is something that's actually external from the rules. It's something that you're kind of attaching to the rules. And the rules can still do interesting things where, um, you know, this cool thing happened and we interpret a certain way that becomes a neat emergent moment. The other approach might be, for instance, to have the game's rules be talking about how the story ought to go um, and have, you know, to whatever extent, the other skills, the other combat, that sort of stuff be secondary to the story. Um, by and large, the most common thing is going to have the game's mechanics be about the combat and that sort of thing, and then the story is sort of tacked on. Um, well, could you say that that it is it is something that, is, in my experience with D&D, for example, mm-hmm. um, yes, the combat is, is something where the mechanics themselves are, of course, the focus of the actual rules, mm-hmm. but... It doesn't necessarily mean it's the focus of the campaign that you're yes. playing. Right. So, you know, it could be the campaign where, I mean, it, you could you could also make the argument that um, you don't even necessarily need rules for the storytelling portion. I would totally agree. So you can have yeah. them, and it gives you a very different experience. Mm-hmm. It also makes the story more, um, I don't want to say controlled, but mm-hmm. it makes it, 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 it adds a little bit more of a challenge to mm-hmm. it, I guess, especially from the, like, from the GM perspective. Right. Um, which is all, as opposed to just... It, it does give some structure, too, because there is always that problem when you're in a, a role-playing group and the players are maybe not the most um, uh, serious or mm-hmm. maybe fair, and they decide that they want to just do the exact opposite of what the GM has planned. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they want to... They're supposed to be these heroes mm-hmm. that are trying to, you know, restore restore the light to these magical crystals or something, right. and then instead they decide to go around and, you know, try to barter with some guy in the, in the village, and when he doesn't give them a good enough deal, they decide to start slaughtering villagers. Yeah, and they now just burn the village. Down. Right, and now all of a sudden you're, you're, you're in this completely different story, and mm-hmm. the GM's like, well, what are you going to do now? I had I had all these like characters and, and life that I had breathed in this village, and now they're mm-hmm. all gone. It, it's it's funny how often I hear people tell me stories of like, oh yeah, in my group it always just turns into uh, like you know just burning down every village they visit as if it's some unique thing. It's like, I've heard that from like 90% of the people I've talked to D&D about. So apparently village burning is more common than people might think. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, I mean, like what you're saying, though, is that, you know, essentially there's the, the game system. And if you want to sort of think of it this way in a video game, you know, kind of like the mechanics of the game, the programming of the game, and then the story is kind of added on top of that. Mm-hmm. Um, it really just comes down to the style of the GM and of the group. You know, do you want to focus on the story more or the, the gameplay more? Um, but then there are also role-playing games that, um, try to make the story be affected mechanically, and not just the the um, the workings of the world. If that makes sense. Well, I think you both hit on something really important, um, Jim. You were talking about um, basically narrative tension. If players discover or decide that uh, there's not enough conflict or narrative tension in a scene, they'll create it. Um, but what about the sort of equal and opposite problem, which is you've got this quest where go up to the top of the mountain and fight the dragon, and instead of doing that, they spend the first session in town, selling their stuff and bartering with some, you know, local yokel. What what you've got from, I guess, from a like a movie perspective or a TV show perspective is a downturn in tension. Mm-hmm. Um, is that is that good or is that bad? I mean, is that okay? I mean, I would say at least in every experience that I have, that tends to be what happens at, right off the bat. It's, mm-hmm. it's just sort of the preparation. Mm-hmm. So it's almost it's almost like the you know the very first the exposition of the story, the very early part before you even start going on your journey. You have to prepare, and we and sort of yeah we we there's over preparing because you're yeah. expecting to die, which is kind of <laughs> weird, especially in the new D and D systems. Don't expect to die. It's it's set up so that you won't die. It's too easy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but but I mean, I can totally understand why that's become a trend because. Especially going farther back in those systems, it was a lot easier to die. Mm-hmm. So you wanted to make sure that you were prepared. Mm-hmm. And now I think it's just because people like messing with the GM part of it <laughs> in terms of getting deals, like yeah. going in and like trying to get special deals on mm-hmm. on new swords and equipment. And mm-hmm. Well, um, I think too that we sort of accept role playing as being a long form medium. 
for storytelling. Sure. So, you know, we wouldn't show... If we showed any preparation in the show, for instance... Um, it would be only stuff that's kind of important to the characters or important to the story or things mm-hmm. that might come into play later. Like it's um, they're picking up like this extra item that they don't think they're going to need, but it comes into play later because like oh, it's a great thing that I grabbed this at the store earlier because mm-hmm. and that you know if it was just sort of pulled it out magically out of thin air, it's like where'd they get that thing? So they you know show it happening earlier just so right. it's not like this random yeah. thing that happens. Well, do you remember when they did those D and D movies like the live action Dungeons and Dragons movies? Uh, I don't know if you all seen them. Yeah, I, I'd seen a little bit of the cartoon. Yeah, oh. I remember the cartoon. Well, I mean the actual the actual films. Uh, they weren't actually good. I guess the second one was okay, but they were not really good. But they're interesting, particularly the first one, uh, which is bad. I think also <laughs> it did have Jeremy Irons though as the uh, villain. Oh, right, right. Boy, so he actually does a. He, he goes way over the top with it, which is great. Um, but uh, they they really don't spend enough time in town, and I'd love to see a. A, a realistic D and D movie <laughs> where it's like like maybe the first like uh, you know thirty minutes of this hour and a half movie mm-hmm. is just them in town bartering, and then <laughs> that's that's the first part, right. and then the next part is them traveling like to wherever they're supposed to go. Like that's maybe like forty five minutes, mm-hmm. and then the final yeah, and the and random encounters. The final <laughs> the final part of it is this like sped up moment where like you know the everyone kind of realizes wow this game has been going on too long and they suddenly somehow managed to get to like wherever they were supposed to get to like the mm-hmm. goal which is to say the dragon on top of the mountain yeah they get there way sooner than it would seem like they maybe should because mm-hmm. other parts took a little longer and people are starting to leave the campaign <laughs> <laughs> and then they, they defeat the dragon and then the return the return portion of the story from the uh the hero's journey uh would be maybe Two minutes, mm-hmm. one minute at the very end. It would happen in the closing credits. Yeah. They would show little like, pictures of it. <laughs> the it, would, it may right. not be the best movie in terms of a story perspective, but it would be, I think, interesting. And mm-hmm. Maybe funny to you know role play role, role players. Here's my answer mm-hmm. to all of that, including my own question. I think the reason why it works to have um, downturn in um, tension, negative tension, if you will. Is because of the agency involved. We have control of the character. Mm-hmm. We are not watching. We're not passive. We're active. Mm-hmm. And so as characters, as active characters, we can build suspense internally and be excited about this thing that's going to happen. And, and in the anticipation of it, because we're living it, or role-playing it, um, is actually a little more satisfying than watching rising action in the typical way. Yep. So... Whenever we're passive, we need rising action. But whenever we're active, we don't. Mm. And I think that translates over into video games, too. Um, one of my favorites, Fallout 3. When you finally get out of the... the um, not, it's not a bunker. It's a... What's it called? Vault. Vault. Yeah, yeah, you get out of the vault. What's the very first thing most players do? Well, they head for the town. Mm-hmm. What do they do? They, they spend hours playing in town. Maybe going on a little quest to the supermarket and kill some stuff and come back. But... For the most part, you're not really ready to head out into the wide world until you've pretty much beaten all the, the stuff in the town. And that's just the way that, that that game, even though it's open world, it's it's structured to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you can do all kinds of stuff. You can nuke that town. You can make whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, I, think, I think that we just kind of design that role play experience around understanding that it's okay if you don't have anything big action-y to do mm-hmm. right away. Um, I don't know. Like, and part of it too is like you know that's not just like the preparation also has chances for information gathering, um, character yeah. development to an extent. You like learn who it is that's giving you the quest, and then you know that might become important later when you come back and they you know potentially give you a reward or you know moving forward that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, they were the bad guy all along. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I mean. It, a lot of the stuff, because it is role playing, it because you're playing as the characters. You know, in a sense, D and D, and this also speaks to its roots as a game. Um, there is a simulationist aspect to it, and in any sort of long form simulation, any sort of you know, say like a, a war game where you've got a full campaign going on, you know, and the battles are kind of like the the dungeons, if you will. Mm-hmm. But there's mm-hmm. still the the troop distribution and the resupplying and all that sort of stuff. If you really want to dig into it, that's also part of the game that you need to think about. So, um, you know, in a way, we're trying to live the experience, if it will, of being an adventurer. Um, like if this was, you know, my job, what I did, 
you know, part of playing that game long term is, you know, doing the in-between stuff as well. Um, it always involves going to a tavern. Yes. Or a bar. <laughs> yes. And getting into a fight, usually. Get, well, of course. You have yeah. to. You're in a bar. <laughs> Isn't that your experience when you go to bars? Is that just... <laughs> it might just be you, Jim. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but, but, did you learn everything you know about bars from D&D? Because that might speak to why that happens. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I do I do call out for flagons of ale, and people look at me funny. You, you call the waitress a winch? Yeah. yeah. Winch, bring me a flagon of ale. <laughs> and then I get thrown out. And bring, then I just kind of keep looking me for a bar while we do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... That being said, uh, you know, my style as a role player has always been more interested in character and more interested in story than kind of that simulation as- simulationist aspect. So when I have played D&D, I always found myself actually really enjoying the town segments yeah. and, like, kind of getting mm-hmm. to play my character a bit. Um, and then whenever we got to a dungeon and, like, it would take two weeks to just, like, sort of crawl through this dungeon of, like, solving puzzles and fighting these enemies, it was just like, oh, kill me. Because, like, it's boring for me. You know, I, I like... You know, maybe it's just because I've sort of... It, it might be that I didn't get introduced to role-playing early enough, this style of role-playing early enough, um, because I, I think I've sort of been spoiled by video games when mm-hmm. the action can be much quicker and much more engaging than sitting there and rolling dice for an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It just I think that what intrigues me about role-playing games, having come to it late in college, in fact, is that... It's a open-ended story, which is something that you don't get from video games. And so I think I kind of separate the two media um, into kind of what makes them more useful in my mind. Well, as, as the old guy at the table, um, I'll throw this in too. Mm-hmm. Just um, for a moment, setting aside all the digital stuff, mm-hmm. which, I, by the way, I agree with you. I think you're right. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we set aside the digital stuff, there's also um, board games, analog board games, that simulate that dungeon experience very, very well. Mm-hmm. Um, Descent comes to mind. Doom comes to mind. Uh, the new Star Wars uh, Imperial Assault comes to mind. And there's lots of others, too. And so if, if you really want that kind of an experience, you can you can do that. But, you know, in the olden days, the ones that did that really well were like Warhammer Quest and, and things like that, um, which actually it's kind of neat how it's come full circle. You can actually get that on... Um, iPad now, mm. and you can you can download it, and then what would have been an evening's worth of entertainment takes about fifteen minutes to run the dungeon, mm-hmm. and because it's all digital and it's been sped up, and so instead the entire campaign, which would have been um, a year's worth of Sunday nights, yeah. is now an evening's worth of entertainment, mm. and it's very very interesting to see how it dilates out, and what's even more interesting is after say about three or four days of playing it, it it gets very, very samey very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so unless you buy the expansions where now you're fighting Ratmen instead of Orcs, um, it's just kind of like, uh, yeah, same same old, same old. Right. So it, it's interesting to see how what you're talking about with, you know, with that digital dice rolling for you mm-hmm. has changed things for us. And I think that, you know, the, the old axiom of um, when do we use robots... Well, we use robots if it's uh, dangerous, if it's boring, if it's, um, you know, a couple other different things. But mm-hmm. really, that's what it comes down to. Uh, difficult, I think, is one of them. Mm-hmm. And when we use complicated math, like, mm-hmm. say, World of Warcraft, mm-hmm. then it makes sense. Um mm-hmm. Because we we're then we're doing it in real time, mm-hmm. and so using the computer for that um, makes sense. Because when you look at the, like say the dice for the the World of Warcraft system, mm-hmm. um, it doesn't in any way at all match mm-hmm. the online experience. Mm-hmm. Some of the design stuff is there, but it's it's not. Um, I don't know. I, I think that I think that what all that leads to, if we funnel it down to its point, is that form follows function. So the question then becomes, what is your group wanting? Yes. Are they wanting uh, a hack and slash, or are they wanting really interesting narrative story with twists and, and normal conventions and um, reversals and things like that in, in the plot? Um, and in then which system 
We'll deliver that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of just to backtrack ever so slightly, going back to the World of Warcraft example that you mm-hmm. gave, um, I think that even in the MMO space, you've got, like, we've already, we've sort of mentioned before the idea that there are different philosophies for different types of players, where the reason people play MMOs in particular, um, what was the name of that one? Um, the Bartle? The Bartle personality. Bartle, yeah. Bartle types. Um, game. The, yeah, the yeah, bottle types. The, 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 the I'm an explorer. Where, the explorer versus the you know the socializer versus the killer, the, the killer, um, all that different stuff. I'd even say that you know depending on the type of game that you're playing, the type of MMO, it might appeal to different types there. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I think that beyond those types, there's even different types of players where what engages them about a game is going to be different. So I know that there are a lot of people who, regardless of what it is they're trying to achieve in the end, that those bottle types. Um, some people really take an interest in like really digging into their character's build and trying to maximize effectiveness and that sort of stuff mm-hmm. to suit their play style. Um, whereas for me, like I find, for example, Star Wars The Old Republic to be much more interesting because I'm thinking about how do I roleplay my character and what decisions do I make based on what I want my character to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I never really cared too much about the builds. And even when I was playing WoW, you know, I was more interested in kind of finishing quests and stuff like that. And of course, you know, optimizing my build can help me finish those quicker and more effectively without dying as much. But it was never like my, I never found much enjoyment personally in sort of min-maxing my character. Yeah. Whereas I know a ton of people who would, and that's like what they play the game for. Which is probably why I don't play, you know, beyond level, well, top level. <laughs> it used to be level 60 <laughs> and then 70 and then, you know, and so on and so forth. But Yeah, I know that um, at least... You know, going back on some of the stuff that y'all have been saying with the role playing experience, I think that there's a little more to it than just those two extremes of like just the combat and just the narrative. Because mm-hmm. I know um, some of the stuff that I really like in terms of the I, I don't want to call them combat, but I guess the dangerous zones, mm-hmm. you know, outside of the town zones, are things like um, not just puzzles, which there are, which are usually actually pretty fun, mm-hmm. um, which is where you have to think as yourself, not just as your character, right. and and try to figure out. Uh, how to, how to get through maybe into the next room to use like a labyrinth example, um, but also the interactions with uh, potentially hostile people or characters mm-hmm. and um, not hostile characters and how you going how how you um, interact with other creatures inside dangerous areas as, a, as I, I like the idea of if you see something inside you know, a dungeon or, mm-hmm. like, you know, a, a forest. You don't necessarily have to kill it. Yeah. So I do kind of like that concept. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, with a lot... with There are plenty of groups where if they see something, they're just going to automatically assume it must die. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can kind of play with that mm-hmm. um, a little bit, and I think that that's something that, you know, if you if you establish early on that it's... This is the sort of game where you maybe don't want to, which comes into, again, system. Mm-hmm. If it's a sort of system where combat is really dangerous and you can die really easily yeah. and you can or or maybe not necessarily die but you can get mutilated and so you want to be really careful to you know you maybe want to avoid combat if you can mm-hmm. and you know and something like that if you create that sort of a system and then all of a sudden people including the min maxers mm-hmm. including the ones that are just trying to blow through things and get experience yeah. that's the other thing to add to it mm-hmm. as well by the way is the the way you gain experience yeah if you're only getting experience for killing things people have a pretty big incentive to kill things, to kill things. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. but if you give them experience for uh, finding treasure, mm-hmm. or um, having like a good like solving a puzzle, or having like a um, a productive interaction with an NPC. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, you know, they realize, hey, we can gain experience in a whole bunch of different ways. So why should we go around and kill everything? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and I think you know what you mentioned too with the rules. Like if the rules are ones where the strictness and the detail of the mechanics mean that it's very easy for you to die. Yeah. You know, that's one of those things where the rules do sort of help to create a certain tone, help to create a certain mm-hmm. um, expectation. And so it's so, a doom, too, yeah. when you're playing. Because exactly. you're like, oh, I, I don't want to get in combat. Yeah. I might die. There's a, there's a real <laughs> sense of danger. Whereas a lot of, st- uh, another, a lot of other story-driven systems, um, the only threat you really feel is more related to like what your character wants and less about whether or not you're le- legitimately afraid your character's going to die because very rarely do characters die in sort of story driven well in the, systems. in the new systems yeah yeah <laughs> true <laughs> true some of the older stuff that we've been playing around with mm-hmm. it's well, kinda, well those were designed kind of a grinder <laughs> but, but those were designed like you know dcc for instance right. Dungeon Crawl classics is designed to be a dungeon crawl system you know that's very um, true and i don't think it was meant to be a, a story system inherently um, again, story can be attached to it, just like with any RPG, but it's not 
designed with story in mind necessarily. And Dungeon Crawl Classics is a lot like the old, very early D and D, right? The original feels like D and D, like old D and D. Mechanically, it's a lot more simplified, but mm-hmm. the the feel is there, mm-hmm. the old feel. And you know, they they also they explicitly say in the introduction that the premise of the game is that you're just you know basically a greedy guy who's after the treasure and the glory of delving into dungeons. You're a role player. Yeah, exactly. So they're not even making any pretense of like, you know, there, there is an alignment system, like there's lawful, uh, neutral, and chaotic, just like in D&D. But um, like, other than that... Greedy, greedy, kind of greedy, mm-hmm. very greedy. <laughs> basically, Extremely greedy. Basically, like, uh, it might slightly alter your motivations for doing certain things, but for the most part, it's just you're after... You know, you go into the dungeon because that's what you do, and you get the reward from the dungeon because that's why you go through the dungeon. And that's, you know, it's, it's not making any pretenses about like I'm doing this to, uh, you know, uh, fulfill my lifelong dream of doing this or to avenge my whatever. You know, it's, it doesn't care about your background. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you kind of have to populate that in yourself mm-hmm. as you play, if you if you choose to. Yes. And you know, I'm not I'm not trying to say that by any stretch that um you know these sort of mechanics heavy systems can't have great stories i mean i've seen a lot of really good examples of good gms who are able to take these systems and use them in such a way that you know the the stories can be uniquely engaging and intriguing because of the mechanical sort of emergence that you get um, or mechanics Mm -hmm. leading to emergent stories um some really interesting moments can happen where like you know you legitimately felt like you were on the verge of losing this battle but then someone got a lucky roll at the right moment and hit this thing and it meant a lot to everyone at the table um so it it can it can really work both ways with both types of systems but it's still interesting to think about kind of how you have to bring the story to some systems or vice versa Hmm. well bringing it Bringing it back to discussion, back to the Pierre's journey as we were talking about before. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you've done a lot of um, GMing, Doc, and I was going to yeah. ask: Do you have you ever um, do you ever create outlines based on the hero, at least the broad strokes of the hero's journey, to try to say this is sort of where I feel you know our characters are, are going to receive the call. This is where I feel like they're going to uh, you know leave their world, that kind of thing. For a campaign, I might do that. Yeah. For a session, usually not. Um, what I think of in a scene Mm -hmm. is where is the tension at right now and does it need to go up or does it need to go down and that's that's really what it comes down to if it feels like maybe the players are a little bored or something like that that's on me as a GM Mm -hmm. Um, there there should never be a moment where someone um, you know is is stacking their dice because they're bored or you know gets up for a smoke or something it's just it's not um it's not where I want to be. I want everybody to be just rooted to the table and riveted at what's going on, even if it's not their scene and, and mm-hmm. not what's ha- not what's happening. Not what <laughs> it is not what is happening, but that can't always happen because we're interested in different things. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm creating, you know, a wizard character, or let's kick it into sci-fi. Um, if I'm creating a Jedi character, and I just am really interested in my Jedi, but there's a guy at the table who just isn't interested in the whole Jedi mythos at all. He wants to be a fighter uh, pilot, you know? Mm-hmm. I've got to create a... Uh, if I've got a GM who's, who's got those two guys, I'll shift the tense here, um, I've got to find a situation where both of them can enjoy the fight. And what's cool about Star Wars, as an example, is that there's usually a fight going on in space above the planet, and there's usually something that's happening on a personal scale, on a um, battle scale, and then on a global scale. You see it over and over and over. Any any movie, any scene, um, they've got that going on. And so that's one solution, is mm-hmm. finding ways so that even if the party splits, it works to your advantage. Um, so that can be tough. So to answer your question, um, what I usually do whenever I'm developing something, uh, one of my favorite systems is Burning Wheel, for example. Uh, I will have the characters, or the players make their characters first. Give me their character sheets, then I will look at their motivations and their beliefs and all of that, which is a mechanic that's built into that system. And ask myself, what kind of uh, 
world does it seem like they want to be playing in? A dangerous one that's out to get them, or a mysterious one that's there for them to explore, or you know, some you know something that they can go and kill. What what is it that that looks like they're doing? And then I will create a state of being for them, um, another world, if you will, for them to, to cross over into, a boon for them to go find, and then uh, a win condition for the for the conflict that's established. But as far as sequence goes, it's entirely up to them. Um, usually, I don't I don't prescript dungeons. I don't hmm. create nemeses until I need them. Um, one of my dirty little tricks is to create an NPC, and if they think that he might be betraying them, then make sure that he doesn't. <laughs> um, yeah. And or the opposite. Um, sometimes alignments for me are a fluid thing that happen narratively. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It, a lot of it depends on what needs to happen in that moment. So if there needs to be someone who um, causes tension, I'll create an NPC on the spot, and then they they create tension or relieve tension if it's gotten too too crazy. Cool. Yeah, I know. Um, the re- I just the reason I asked was because we were talking about the. You know, mechanics of story right, and right. background and the hero, hero's journey and all that. Um, I know that in my experience running campaigns, um, some that I've done, you know, in person, usually with our own sort of open, free-flowing system. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also I've had a lot of experience doing uh, forum role-playing, which is kind of a different GM experience, but it is a GM experience. Um, and I know that the way that I would, I would build a campaign in uh, the forum role-playing experience uh, was always much more structured. Um, I always had, I did always have those plans. I didn't base it off the hero's journey, but I mm-hmm. did have um, an outline and basic understanding of story structure. Um, I didn't, I guess I really didn't have a deep understanding of the hero's journey at that point, but I sort of understood how stories were, were made because I read a lot of stories. I mean, it's fairly intuitive. So I, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I sort of like had an, a concept of that. So I would always try to give, just have certain story uh, points that I would want to want them to hit. Um, there was, of course, that element of people wanting to go off and do their own thing and, and possibly having to make changes and that kind of thing. But I would always generally have um, a structure in mind. And I think what the reason I was able to do that was because the community in a forum, forum role-playing is a lot of people that were basically all writers. They all want to write, and they're mm-hmm. all looking for to go through a story. Mm-hmm. So it's really a lot less about the mechanics and more about the story. They're expecting to get that story experience. And so and they're, you're expecting you to write a lot, and you're expecting them to write a lot about what they're doing, and then you have to you know, interpret that based on um, your characters and the NPCs and all of that, and make sure that it all fits together into one big story. So they're all, because they're all writers and they're all coming from that place, it makes it a lot easier to stick to structure. Right. Whereas my experience with just you know, players mm-hmm. and you, generally friends mm-hmm. um, is that... Sometimes they want to mess with you. Sometimes they want to go off and do their own thing. Mm-hmm. So um, while I might have areas prepared, you know, like dungeons, for lack of a better word, mm-hmm. prepared, I'm not necessarily... And, of course, like towns. And normally that's where I would put the most presenta- uh, preparation would always be towns and NPCs and stuff because I know that that's generally what they like doing. Mm-hmm. They like activities in towns and messing with people in towns and doing things in towns. So that's where I would always... <laughs> put the most effort mm, and it's would, interesting yeah it's, it's, it would always be there and so there always be things to do in towns and, and related quests in towns and things that could be um, so that it's not just we go into town and like slaughter everyone well you can't for whatever reason I don't think I've ever pre-planned a town see that's where that's where I had to pre-plan because I always know yeah. that's what they like they like the towns they like interacting with NPCs and if it's not the town then you then you make space around the town mm-hmm. into that, that sort of interesting space or if it's like a like a dungeon sort of space or a labyrinth then you make the labyrinth the interesting like there's things that live in the labyrinth and there's little like communities in the labyrinth and it's not just walking into a room and, and you're avoiding like the spike trap and then you attack the goblin because mm-hmm. that's generally not interesting for most people that I play with mm-hmm. at least not for any anything more than like a few minutes mm-hmm. I think a good comparison is actually um uh, or kind of like a good metaphor to sort of explain my thought on that is the uh, Legend of Zelda. Mm. I know there are a lot of people who love playing Legend of Zelda for the dungeons, that the game is about the dungeons for them. Whereas for me, the dungeons are, while they're entertaining and they're cool, um, for me, they're always the thing I'm trying to get through in order to get to the end of it. You know, I'm, I'm more interested in the 
the the boon I'm trying to retrieve than I am in the journey itself, if that makes sense. Um, it's interesting you bring up Legend of Zelda in this conversation, because I wouldn't really say, aside from the very, very basic story, which is really just more of a tone, mm-hmm. it really doesn't have much of a story. Well, and part of that, too, is like, you know, when I was younger, of course, you sort of get like swept up in the fantasy, like, you're the hero and you're going on some oh, adventure. yeah, I mean, that's, so, like, that's what I'm saying. It's the, the, the tone itself mm-hmm. is very strong, and it, get, and it does have, yeah. a, have that, that very... Um, I don't. I don't want to say inspirational. Mm. It just have that. It does have that. Mm. You know, evokes that feeling of adventure and heroism that is that draws you in. And I was, you know, really into that too. But I mean, in terms even of the if the story, yeah, even if the story itself isn't the reward, yeah. though, it's kind of that sense of progression of accomplishment. Right. That's so true. What I'm not. I'm not so much interested in. Like, oh, cool! I'm so glad I'm at the dungeon because that means I get to do all the fun dungeon stuff. It means <laughs> well, I, I'm at the dungeon now. I'm going to beat the dungeon so I can then move on. But if I if I could interject though, I think when you're going through the dungeons, mm-hmm. you've got like the dungeons in Zelda are meant to be these places of tension. Mm-hmm. So you're supposed to feel when you get there, when you when you accomplish and beat the dungeon and beat the boss and mm-hmm. get the piece of the Triforce or the crystal, whatever mm-hmm. it is that you're getting in this particular game, mm-hmm. you're supposed to feel that. Yeah, I did it. You know, yeah, great yeah. sense. Oh, of course. But of when course, you enter the dungeon. Mm-hmm. You're not necessarily supposed to think, because that's like a meta way to think of it, mm-hmm. uh, and that's what an older gamer might think, like, mm-hmm. oh, great, I'm in the dungeon, now I get to solve puzzles. Yeah. What you're supposed to think is, oh, shoot, I'm in mm-hmm. this dungeon, yeah, yeah. I could get killed at any moment. Yeah. This and, is and, the yeah. sense of dread. So, so if you were feeling mm-hmm. that, that's what you're supposed to be feeling. Yeah. That's what oh, yeah, to- designed Totally, for. totally. And that's, I think that's the thing, too, is maybe the, the trick is to not be meta about it. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you're sort of, like, you know, and, and if you're embodying a character in a video game or even in a role-playing game, um, I think, like, what's interesting to me is the things that, if you're really sort of getting into it, you know, like, what it is that you're actually interested in. Um, you shouldn't want to die, essentially, yeah. is what yeah. you're saying. You shouldn't be like, you oh, sh- I died, ha, ha, ha. Well, no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not even saying that. I'm saying that, like, even, like, if I'm getting into character, what my character's interested in is not having fun playing through the combat, and that's why I find the combat boring, because if it drags on too long, I'm not getting to what I'm interested in. If that makes sense, hmm. I guess so. I mean, I always like for me the combat. Not to focus too much on Zelda, but yeah, the mm-hmm. combat was always something that it wasn't so much that I'm like, oh yay, combat. Mm-hmm. It was something where I was, especially the early Zelda games, like the original Legend mm-hmm. of Zelda and Zelda Two. Mm-hmm. Um, you get into combat and you feel like, oh crap! Mm-hmm. Not only because not only were you worried about dying, you mm-hmm. were worried about taking any damage at all. Sure, because then you would have to find some way to replenish your health, or if you get to the boss and now you just die because mm-hmm. you have low health. So every single fight was this like really mm-hmm. tense experience. Mm-hmm. And what I like about doing that in video games is that you get that tension and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff, but it happens in a much quicker uh, much quicker pace, a much correct. Like it's a different scale. Um, whereas when you're doing that in a tabletop role playing game and you're basically taking an hour out of your three hour session just to resolve two fights. Um, but doesn't that depend on the system? It does depend on the system, and that's why I tend to prefer systems to get through combat quicker. Um, I'm just sort of saying that I'm, I'm trying to sort of hash out in my, you know, thinking out loud, why is it that people enjoy, um, you know, kind of like the, the nitty-gritty parts of the mechanical, mechanically-driven role-playing stuff. And it, again, it comes down to sort of player preference. Yeah, For me, I, I'm, it's not my thing. I, I think but, in combat, if you're... If you if you really want to get into the minutia of, you know, a sword fight, mm-hmm. and you really want to get into the minutia of, you know, blocking and what sort of what sort of strike that you're going to be putting mm-hmm. in, and, and can your armor handle mm-hmm. this sort of attack and that kind of stuff, and you really want to get into all the little minutia, mm-hmm. that that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. It's basically on, a puzzle. on some level. It's, yeah, it's and a so puzzle it does become a kind form. of a puzzle. Yeah. So I I can see it definitely from that perspective. Mm-hmm. But I totally understand that if, if that's not something that you're into, it can mm. get very boring. Yeah, exactly. So you would definitely wouldn't want to pick a system mm. that is yeah. focused on that. And in, on a, that. in the same time, I'm you know, like I've said already a couple of times that I totally get where people are coming from when that's what they are into. Um, it's just interesting to kind of compare and contrast to those different styles. Mm. So there's a video game called Enslaved Odyssey to the West mm-hmm. that I think is probably my favorite video game. Mm. Um, I bring it up because it is linear. And even though it is linear, it does have RPG elements. Uh, very minor ones. It's probably the least number of RPG elements that a game could have and still be considered to maybe be one. Uh, but it mostly has to do with what you level up in your fighting. And so it, it's it's sort of about choosing, sort of like classing your, your abilities, if mm-hmm. you will. But generally it's about 
beating robots with the giant um, stick in the post-apocalypse. I mean, that's really what it's about. Mm-hmm. It's it's a reimagined post-apocalypse version of Journey to the West, right? That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. But it is an absolutely gorgeous game. Um, it, it does post-apocalypse as the flowers have taken over, and it's just beautiful. Um, I love it. That said... Um, there are some bosses in there that can really kick your tail. They're they're good. I mean, it's not like you know, Ninja Gaiden type nasty. Mm-hmm. But um, what I love about that is that they know what the story is that they're trying to tell, and they tell that story. And at that perfect narrative moment where you're like, ah, oh, yeah, they're falling in love. Ah, uh, then the third character is introduced, and suddenly it becomes a love triangle because this guy, his name's Pigsy. He's this grotesque, horrible thing, but he's known her since she was a little girl, and oh man, you're gonna lose her. And it and it's just these perfect things happen that in a in an open world wouldn't work. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um And so when you compare that to something like Fallout Three where it's like you gotta go find your father and it's about this this redemption story with healing with the father and that kind of a thing. That that part of it just is like an afterthought, it doesn't work. Um, even to the point where, like, the, the meaningful choice at the end, it's an old game, so I don't mind doing the yeah. spoiler. Um, you basically have the choice to send your companion in and die or go in yourself and die. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's a super meaningful choice at the end, sort of, kind of, but not really. But then it becomes even less meaningful if you play the DLC because then you wake up in a hospital. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and no, then you're it, like, wait, why did I sacrifice my companion? I, I, Reload. <laughs> I, didn't like the, uh, I didn't like the story at all in Fallout 3. I could go on and on and on and on because I was a huge Fallout Fallout fan original. Yeah. yeah and what's, what's upsetting about that thing, that you know, the DLC thing, mm-hmm. is that... Um, they had DLC for like Dragon Age, for instance, Dragon Age um, Awakening versus Origins. Um, if your main character dies in Origins, um, like it's possible to carry that character into the Awakening expansion. But mm-hmm. if your character's dead, they just give you a new warden, and that's the new character. Right. The, the second game, they just call you Warden Commander because either your first guy gets promoted, or now you're playing as the Warden Commander. Um, but it, it allows you to have your character die and not just be like, oh, guess what? You're in a hospital. You know, it's like, like you said, it's like, why did I sacrifice my companion? Then? Mm-hmm. You know, the choice means a whole lot less if it's just like, oh yeah, it would have come back. Yeah. <laughs> well, some games do that when um, they, they're expecting there to be like, if they give you a choice within the game, but it's part of a series, mm-hmm. they might they might have to choose. This was the canon mm-hmm. outcome. Yeah, yeah. You know, like Knights of the Old Republic. There's parts in the story that you can mm-hmm. you can change around. But then, you know, for the sequel, as they're continuing on, they had to choose what actually happened mm-hmm. in the background. So there, there's that, too, and you can kind of understand from a storytelling standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, then, of course, there's examples like the Fallout, Fallout 3 DLC, which is just mm-hmm. inexcusable. But to be fair, I didn't mind as much with that because, uh, for starters, I thought some of the DLC on, on Fallout 3 was better than the actual game. I agree. And, uh, and secondly, the story in, in Fallout 3, in my opinion, was, like... The actual main story was just terrible. Mm. I didn't care about mm-hmm. finding my father. Didn't care at all. Like every single main story quest, I just did because I felt like I kind of had to. I didn't really like those. Yeah. So it didn't really bother me as much from that perspective. I did kind of. I, I mean, I remember really hating the way they did the ending with the whole forced sacrifice nonsense. It just mm-hmm. came across. As, it came across as, as very forced and just kind of out of nowhere. And mm. in terms of, it just it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like this was structured for. You're in an open world game. And then it comes down to this one choice that doesn't really... Like, the binary choices in, in Fallout 3, I think, is really what got me. Because Fallout was always about gradations of morality. Yeah. For me. The original two. Hand him a water bottle or stab him in the eye. Yeah, yeah. that that became... Well, but... the, the <laughs> I'm talking about 3. Yeah, 3, yeah. I mean, or like, you're, you're the ultimate savior of a town, or you nuke it. Like, right. There was no... There's no gray area, which is why I like New Vegas so much more, because they brought back in... Um, you were not really a hero or a villain. You were. Uh, it was a lot more faction based. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't perfect, but it was a lot more faction based. So you became. You know, these guys really thought that you're great for whatever reason, and then this other pe- these other people didn't like you, and you can't really be on par with everyone. Some yeah. people will like you, and some won't, and it becomes. It becomes a little more gray, and you kind of have to determine things for yourself if if you're a good person or not. It isn't. There, there's still some of that in there with you know there, you can still be a good person, mm-hmm. but it's at least there's more levels of gray and there's more little things that you can do. Fallout Three just I mean the most basic morality system you could possibly get to. Mm-hmm. I do think, and I, I really would love to because I know we're we're running pretty long, but I do think a subject for a later podcast should be morality systems in games, and we should talk about particularly some older games. 
uh, morality systems mm. and how complex some of them were. I'm not even just talking about Fallout. There's a lot of them that are very, very complex. Um, some of the uh, like Ultima Four and mm-hmm. some of the some of the Ultima series and some of the morality that they did was really interesting, even though the games kind of sucked in my opinion. But the morality system was was really mm-hmm. good, and just kind of where we come have come today in terms of morality systems and how it's such for the most part such a giant step back and why that might be and what can we do to get back to um, playing with these complex systems. That sounds like a topic for a but future podcast. That's what I'm yeah. saying. I would, yeah. I would it's love funny to, is I think, I think we say that like every topic. time, but then like... We need to go back and listen because yeah. we always forget. We always yeah. forget our... our We're going to listen to our, our own stuff? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I think sometimes too we say like, you know, next time in jest. Um, we shouldn't <laughs> say next time, but, yeah, but not next time, yeah, but it's some... Podcast, in a future but, podcast, yeah. this will be a topic, mm-hmm. I think, because it is something that I've been um, sort of refreshed over and especially I've been playing over um, Pillars of Eternity, the new sort of Baldur's Gate-like mm-hmm. game, Baldur's Gate 2 well, I think game. you are dancing around something really important. Mm-hmm. And in the Fallout example, um, Fergus Arkhart wasn't on 3. Yeah. And, you know, he was he was the heart and soul of it. Mm-hmm. And so one could argue that whenever he came back to the project then for New Vegas, that that's the reason why it felt so much like 2. I agree. No, I, I completely agree. And I also think it's also because Fallout 3 was developed by the same people, you know, at Bethesda that had done Oblivion. Yeah. And so it felt like a post apocalyptic Elder Scrolls. Yeah, it was didn't a recent. Feel, yeah, it didn't really feel anything like Fallout, aside from you know, the enemies in the world, sure, but it yeah. was just not gameplay wise mm-hmm. and tone, even. It was just. Oh, it, props for the mechanics, though. They really did yeah. a good job with that. Mm-hmm. So that system was a cool. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. Which, you know, how do you bring something that quite frankly, was archaic at that time, um, you know, with a, with a three-quarter view into a 3D space and still keep it with um, turn-based. Yeah. And no, yeah, the VATS was, was great. The VATS system was a great it solution did, It to did that, a very so. good job with that. But no. Anyway. Yeah, some of the, some of the programming the, and that to it, and of course, obviously, just uh, the, 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 the technicians and, all, and the programmers that were all behind... Uh, the open world aspect and all the stuff that they have to do from mm-hmm. like all the crazy math and all like building this world and having all the physics work I mean that's you know monumental mm-hmm. so I'm oh, not yeah. saying it was oh, a yeah. bad game I'm just saying from the story perspective from the no you're just the pinning morality. the writers to the wall and that's, that's I cool am, I can, and I, can and I that. think I think that I'm doing that justifiably <laughs> <But> <laughs> and something I think though that like it's sort of in Fallout 3's defense something that they did that I thought was commendable too was in an age where we'd kind of forgotten about those old school games like kind of the classic Fallouts because I've not, actually never played the classic Fallouts and there are a lot of old school games you know the box play. is coming out you'll be able to get them all yeah exactly play them um, while, you, while you have the wizard on in the background yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's right it's so bad um, but the uh, the thing that they did that's kind of cool is that like for us gamers who never had to get, never got the chance to experience that we got to sort of get a glimpse at what that was like and so for me the morality system was like this is revolutionary this is awesome I've got choice in a video game you know uh-huh. <laughs> and it was like this really cool thing I hope you played New Vegas I, I have played New Vegas okay. yes and it, it was it was it an improvement a lot of a lot um, more gradation yes which I do like um, but for someone who went from no morality systems or maybe like you know KOTOR was the nearest thing to you know basically it was it, it felt to me like KOTOR because it was basically mm-hmm. like yeah. this binary thing you go up and down the slider with the karma and that was the morality system I thought it was cool I think KOTOR Tour two did a pretty good job, actually, of, ha- of adding gray area. I know, I know, it did a very good job. It gets a lot of of, of negative views, mm. unfortunately. Well, you have to take it within the context rushed, of when but, it was made, and it's so easy for us five years later when you know other Me Too games have come out and maybe even done it better to go, ah, it's not as good as blah. Well, guess what? It, it came out first. <laughs> it, it invented thing. Yeah. So we have yeah. to we have to do that. Anyway, um, I, I want to I want to close with a question. Okay. Um, and my question is this: Why do you role play? Speaking specifically of tabletop role play, but not necessarily. Um, I don't know. Just kind of to to explore not just necessarily um, another world, but to explore another like character and personality and. Um, you know, outlook. Like to sort of, I guess it's it's sort of a, a way to be someone else and explore different perspectives without actually having real ramifications for it, I suppose. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one way to put it. Because I know I've definitely, 
and I'll admit, I'm, I've been part of parties that have mm-hmm. burned down towns before. Yeah. I've done the reverse too. I've mm-hmm. done, I've been like you know the Paragon, and I've been everything in between. I think so. Mm-hmm. Um, I find it very interesting to um, explore different choices and how they might, um, you know, the interaction and, and that kind of thing. So I do mm-hmm. think I do like the freedom. I think is another is the big thing. Along kind of goes along with that mm-hmm. that you get in a tabletop setting versus a video game where. Um, you have certain freedom, and you know, we talked about morality choices mm-hmm. and, and the freedom that you can you have in some games like you know, Fallout, even the earlier Fallouts, or you know some of these earlier games, even a game like uh, some of the early open world games like Ultima, where you had a lot of things that you could do. But uh, that sort of freedom is nothing like the sort of freedom that you have when you're actually de- interacting with a real person mm-hmm. that is able to say uh, that. Basically, this, that can let you do essentially anything, assuming this is in the rules. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. I think, too, uh, sidetracking just a little bit. Um, you can it, answer I, the I'm, question, too, Chris. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to. <laughs> um, I think uh, it's probably been done somewhere, I'm sure, but there ought to be an RPG that's just called Town Burners. Um, <laughs> and it's about being a party that goes around burning down towns. You're, just the, you're the Hellraisers. Maybe that's what's called. Here's Hellraisers. our next card game, Town yeah. Burners. I was going to say, do, do something like that, and then... What you do is the at, at the very end, like those people leave or like they burn out of the town. You have a short little campaign. In the next campaign, you create characters to go hunt them down. Mm. Interesting for like being you know terrorists. So they go to the town that they're in and then burn that down. No, this, these people are now 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 have to be uh, essentially they, 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 they become like, the villains in your next campaign. Yeah, they, they are the <laughs> villains. Then now you you're now hunting down your old characters. So it, it's the town burners, and then you play as the bounty hunters, right? And then oh. you play as the rebuilders, and they play as the town burners again. So it's, it's a cycle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the bounty hunter hunters. There you go. No, well, no, maybe maybe. Um, but yeah, so the answer to uh, why do I role play? Um, I think for me, it's kind of an interesting way of, um, in sort of the same way that Jim said, exploring these ultimate worlds. Um, if it's an IP that I know, it's interesting to sort of see how might I behave or how might a character that I devise behave in this IP. Um, Star Wars is a cool example because it's like, you know, they're the sort of the, the stories you're told in Star Wars, but it's like, okay, what would happen if like we're still in the Star Wars universe, but there was this situation and we had this sort of character, and it's kind of fun to explore that, um, mm-hmm. kind of like let your writing instincts take over a little bit, um, sort of write this character that you're playing in a way, um, or if it's not an IP that you know, then kind of be like, what's what what sort of world would I be interested in? What sort of scenarios would I be interested in? And again, you know, it kind of I think speaks to my storytelling um, instincts. I'm not necessarily the greatest creative writer but i like to think that when i'm role playing i'm kind of thinking about how the characters stories are going to be playing out how the overall story is going to play out um and it's kind of cool to sort of get into character in that way and be thinking about um you know motivations and when this thing happens how would i respond and kind of um you know printing a bit of yourself onto it too kind of like if i was in this situation and again like you said jim you know um what is the experience like for me so is it my turn? Sure. Okay. Uh, if you want to answer your own question. I will answer my own question. <laughs> um, I'll give you the right answer. Okay. It's... <laughs> no, I, 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 do, do tell professor. <laughs> I, I echo everything you guys said. I think you're absolutely right. I think the number one thing for me, the big thing for me, is um, as much as I love computer games and role-playing games on the computer, um, you know, I've, I've played many, many of them. I've taught it. I've designed them. It, there is nothing that we can do with a computer yet that mirrors that creative spark that comes from a human being telling the story. Mm -hmm. And I think even if you have a more limiting system, and I'm not going to pick on D&D specifically. Oh, wait, I just did. Um, (laughs) But... um, You can do Pathfinders. Oh, there we go. (laughs) Those those posers, those Pathfinder... No, no, I'm Um, No, pick pick the most linear system that you want. Pick the most uh, modular campaign that you want. There's still going to be a human element to it. Mm And there's going to be a human making the decision of when something happens. And um, I remember we were playing the other day in um, a very, very linear campaign. And it was kind of a grind. And we were having fun with it because it was that. But because the GM was making the decision that when I walked through the door, suddenly an axe hit me in the face with the Minotaur that had just popped out of nowhere, Mm -hmm. that, that seemed more narratively appropriate Mm -hmm. because the human had made the choice and so you can roll um dice and you should roll dice because that you know adds that 
random element into it mm -hmm. or pick cards or whatever your, your randomizer is. Mm -hmm. um, and you should have rules and you should follow those rules and you should break those rules whenever it's appropriate to. But the truth is that every video game, even World of Warcraft and its open worldness, is still a fixed, closed system. Mm -hmm. And a human being's brain is an open system. And I love tabletop gaming because you're interacting with an open system. And literally anything that is imaginable could happen at that point. And the GM has the discretion to say, we're throwing this rule out of the window right now because it's cool mm -hmm. to do this thing. To me, that's what it really comes down to. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reminds me of what I was saying earlier with um, you know, knowing when the right time to break the rules is. Yeah. From an artist's perspective, yeah. it's the same thing with tabletop role-playing. When do you break the rules? And when do you follow them? Because that's when that's what makes it work. Yeah, I strongly believe that the best campaign is going to be the one where the GMs all arms are where the players almost die, but then succeed in the end. Mm -hmm. Where you where you per Campbell mm -hmm. get to that moment of almost complete and total failure, and then don't quite fail. The truth is, um, Frodo got to the edge of the mountain in Mount Doom, and then. Almost kept the ring. He he was going to keep the ring. If Gollum hadn't been there to bite his finger off, mm -hmm. Frodo of the Nine Fingers, right? remember that one? <laughs> um, it it wouldn't have it wouldn't have happened. The hero wasn't that heroic in that moment, um, and that's really interesting. Um, and in fact, Tolkien had a whole uh, special kind of term for that that broke away from it. The idea that uh, um, the hero couldn't kind of fail mm -hmm. anyway um, and that and there's a whole scholarly essay on that mm -hmm. but um, that doesn't really matter the point is that I think what's interesting about role playing is that we're playing flawed humans mm -hmm. you know and whenever you're playing Link Link never makes an ambiguous moral choice even when he's asked at the very beginning will you save the princess and you say no they say are you sure and then you're forced to say yes <laughs> Like, uh, haha, you're silly. Yeah, exactly. But do, do you want me to explain this all again? Yes. I mean, no. I mean, <laughs> ah. <laughs> start over. And keep hitting that A button. Um, <laughs> that nefarious owl. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's what it comes down to for me, and that's why I don't like systems where you die. Mm. Um, if you're playing the eighth night into a campaign, uh, eighth week into a campaign, and then your character dies, that's not fun to me. Um, so it's not the danger of dying is, is not enough of it to me to have that mechanic in the system and so a system that allows you an out a little bit of a deus ex machina if you will um, I think is, is probably a good thing mm -hmm. being able to buy it back right, right. roll your character over or um, you know, throw in some Artha or mm -hmm. you know, spend a deed point, whatever. I like that one system Will was talking about, where you have the uh, basically the the meat shield take the hit for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's one, one of your crewmates, the red shirt, essentially. The red shirt guy is yeah. the one who takes the hit. So, so um, as we as we brainstorm our system, um, Chris, I want to make sure that as we have talked about, that that's not even really a factor. Mm. So I'm excited, and, and that works best when you're playing with the right sort of people. Well, I wouldn't say the right sort. A certain sort of people. No, that's true. Yeah, you that's, get your that's, that's in the true world, for any system. Yeah. And that's true school gamers. And, and I guess it, it really boils down to this for me. If you're going to play a system where you can die, and you're going to go into a grinder, everybody needs to know and agree that that is the system you're using, well, that's mm -hmm. what the GM is intending to do, and you're playing it straight. And that's one philosophy, and there's nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. It's just not my personal preference. Right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, it's about time for us to start winding down, but we'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that... You can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, in any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, frog in my throat. <laughs> it's been there for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, we decided to move that little segment to the uh, toward the end of the show so we can just hop right into the action at the beginning without making you guys wait 15 minutes to hear the theme song. Because too, too meta. Way too meta. Way too meta. Well, even you know, we're a podcast that discusses how to make games. So, yeah. Oh, is that what this is about? <laughs> kind of. I mean, sort of. it's one of the things we do. So We did sort of make part of a game that we're going to play later tonight. But the start that, that is a point, though. Is like, is, is it 
it's not really meta until you're being meta about yourself. You know, but like if you're if you're. So like, now it's meta. Now it's meta. That, okay. Wow. <laughs> well. All right. Well, on that note, I think that's that's about all we have for today. Yes. Uh, so I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And uh, I guess I'm Doc. Okay. And we'll, get, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. The title of this episode: Metacognition. Yeah. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, what's your favorite RPG system, and what is your approach to narrative? Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.